Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning and always good to be in the Lord's house as we give God our thanks and praise for God's grace to us this day and every day. So great to have uh, some of the Granite State Ringers with us. Of course, Joan is with us, our old, uh, not old, that's not the right word. <laughs> our previous... <laughs> our previous administrative assistant, and to have Heidi and Hillary and Deb, thank you all so much for being here with us this morning. Uh, we're gonna start this morning with our children's serving, so if uh, any children wanna come forward. Let us rise and we begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. We begin this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit. 
so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As I call and ordain minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to have the reading of the names now, and I want to thank Bill Hauser for doing that, because if you ever heard me do it, it doesn't go well. So, Bill, thank you so much for reading the names. Let us remember Harry and Emily Amptman, Ruth Appleton, Albert R. Alexander, Ilza Ammon, Klaus Ammon, Roth Appleton, Heinrich and Leonid Arendt, Carolina Backen, Charles and Lillian Bardo, Gabriel Bardo, Arthur and Ellen Benton, Dennis Benton, Grace Benton, Barbara Bowie Hempel, Greta Brown, Jim Bump, Irene Carrigan, Sandra Kaplan, Tessa Carter, Muriel Cavanaugh, Dawn Champagne, <coughs> Sean Cloutier, <coughs> Mike Cooperwriter, David Cover, Robert E. Cox, Vince Cunningham, Sarah Dalzell, Chambers Deal, Sophia Deal, Hope Elizabeth Derry, Gunna Dorrell, Adeline Halley Devoid, Ron Deal, Jane Dillon, Phil Dillon, Taylor Dillon, Jane Dillon, Phil Dillon, James Doyle Sr., Brian Dalabak, Albert Dupper, Maria Dupper, Bill and Adeline Ebley, Kingsbury Isinger, Violet Isinger, Axel and Esther Eliasson, Evers and Teresa Eliasson, Oscar and Gretchen Engstrand, Miriam Ursek, Dean Estabrook, Mildred and Maurice Estabrook, Vernon and Ethel Erickson, <coughs> Eleanor Ellie Feiner, Pauline and Wilbur Fisk, Charlene Fitzmorris, Shirley Fitzmorris, Bertha Reinhardt Fleming, Fleming, Eileen Starkey Fleming, Melissa Geth Fleming, Ori Fleming Jr., Michelle Fontaine, Edward and Lydia Frain, Mary Ellen Virgily Frashauer, Paul Fuda, Hope and Earl Goodwin, Mildred Prouse Goodwin, Doug Grant, Margaret Grass, Francine Gren, Jack Grennan, Michael Guptill, Gary Hale, William Hartford, Michael H. Hobb, Deborah Healy Hauser, Jacob and Catherine Hauser, Thomas Hauser, William H. Hauser, Evelyn and Leo Hogan, Josephine Hogan, Mr. and Mrs. Walter B. Hooker, Charles Hopkins, Louise Hopkins, Robert Hopkins, Diane Howard, Tom Hyde, Tara Rora Iorio, Doris James, Alan Jones, Hans Andrew Johansson, Mildred Evelyn Johansson, Mr. and Mrs. Carl Johnson, 
Elsa Johnson, Nils Johnson, Stephen Johnson, Martin Joseph, Norma Joseph, Larry Cannonen, Molly Kavash, Ed Kelleher, Sylvia Kelleher, Michael Kendall, Norman Kendall, Bernie Kenny, Beverly Kenny, Douglas Kenny, Ruth Kenny, Eleanor Kent, the Reverend Donald Kent, Stephen Clay, Rosella Culling, Betty Koch, Berthold Bert Koch, Dora Maria Koch, Friedrich Koch, Joel Koch, Ida Koch, Wolfgang Koch, Missy Colifrath, Margaret Koster, William Koster, Eleanor Krogsty, Robert Krogsty, <clears throat> Penny Kyle, Kimberly Lafreniere, the Reverend Walter Larson, Elsie Lentz, Jeffrey LaLoya, Velma and Richard Lockhart, John Loprich, Lawrence S. Lowe, Frieda Ludwig, Harry Ludwig, Henrietta Ludwig, <clears throat> Joan Lyford, Arlene McGann, William and Elizabeth McGann, William Bill McGann, Dave Mason, Lendl Matice, Eleanor Matice, Catherine Marie Matice, Kathy May Matice, Cindy McCarthy, Harlan Maurer, Edward Daniel McCready, Edward McCready, Jane McCready, Joanne McCready, Melissa McCready, Patrick McCready, Ralph McCready, Mr. and Mrs. L. P. McManus, Larry McManus, Amber McQuaid, Ralph Mealy, Mary Mealy, Rose Miklos, Lillian and John Millen, Robert Milford, Joan Moore, Gabriel Morales, Molly Morales, Daniel Morley, Dorothy and the Reverend Walter Morton, Fred Mossman, Margaret Peggy Mossman, Robert and Dorothy Morrison, Dr. Gerhard Mueller, Brian Mulvey, Ed Niederheiser, Robert and Dorothy Niedermeyer, Karen O'Hara, Betty and Ruth Pancook, Rudolph Pancook, Bruce Pancook, Elise Pancook, Eric Vincent Payur, Norman H. Payur, Ruth Samuelson Payur, Eugene and Ruth Perkin, Carol Power, Eleanor Prosky, Fred Prosky, Cookie Quijano, Edward Quijano, Millie Quijano, Maria Quijano, Virginia Quinn, the Reverend William Ritzberger, David Roberge, Edward and Ruth Roberts, Louis Russo, Madeline Budgie Russo, Ted Ridberg, James Vincent Samuelson, Martha Scavati, Chatwin Schaffenberg, Frank and Doreen Schroeder, Christian Schopmeyer, Gary Shire, Andy Solinich, Alex Sim, Mary Sim, Marion Sloan, Alice Smith, Betty Smith, Donald Smith, James Smith, Jennifer Smith, Nancy Smith, Elaine Sprague, 
Bill Sprexter, David Standifer, Patricia Standifer, Julia Semsel Starkey, Lowell Starkey Sr., Carl Stevenson, Diane Saran, Laverne Terrell, James Verrick, Catherine Verrick, Bernhard and Ava Vihoff, Mary T. Virgili, Vincent J. Virgili, Robert Wadlager Jr., Rebecca Wagstaff, Martha Waldman, Max Waldman, Mark Andrew Wilensky, Nancy Starkey Wilensky, James Williams, Sam Williams, David and Carrie Williamson, Henry and Helen Williamson, Charles Wolfe, Ann Wolfe, James Wright, Victor Zarek. Let us rise as we sing our gathering hymn, For All the Saints, verses 1, 2, 6, and 7. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world and for the well being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, 
Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. O God, our eternal Redeemer, by the presence of your Spirit, you renew and direct our hearts. Keep always in our mind the end of all things and the day of judgment. Inspire us for a holy life here and bring us to the joy of the resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the reading. Our first reading this morning comes from Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all of this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever forever and ever. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 149, and we will read it in unison. Hallelujah, sing to the Lord a new song, God's praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their ruler. Let them praise their maker's name with dancing. Let them sing praise with tambourine and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in the people and adorns the poor with victory. Let the faithful rejoice in triumph. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the praises of God be in their throat and a two-edged sword in their hand to wreak vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings in chains and their nobles with links of iron, to inflict on them the judgment decreed. This is glory for all God's faithful ones. Hallelujah. 
Our second reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 23. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head of over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us rise for the reading of the gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Then Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on the count of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when they speak well of you, for that is what the ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have do them as you would have them do to you. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts. Be acceptable in thy sight. Amen. What are the lessons that the saints teach us? What is the example that they leave us? Is it that we should be super Christians, live a good and perfect life? In order to officially be considered for sainthood, you have to have lived a, a life of holiness pureness, kindness, and devotion. You have had to have had performed at least two verifiable miracles. You have to be an example to others of what it means to live a godly life. Now I'm going to guess, just a guess, but of all those names that we read this morning, that none of them meet that requirement. That all the people on this list had their own struggles and trials and tribulations, that none of those people were pure, that none of them were perfect. 
And I would argue this morning also that that image of a saint is dangerous. It is dangerous to us spiritually because our life of faith is mired in life. Our faith cannot be taken away from all of those daily tasks and routines and things that we have to face. Consider this, that of all the official canonized saints, there's about 10,000 of them, only 500 of them have been married. Think about that in relation to actual life. (laughs) And of those 500 that were married, there's only one couple that's been married been granted official sainthood. One couple, and the whole, besides biblical people, they don't count, they're way back then, they don't count. Like real people. And that one couple, by the way, for most of their marriage, lived in separate houses. (laughs) Hard to be a saint and be married. (laughs) Of the 10,000 saints, very few of them had children. And all the people that had children are saints, of course, are women. And most of those women, their husbands died, and they opened up an orphanage for other kids who who needed a home. Hard to be a saint and be married and have children. (laughs) And then we have to discuss, what does it even mean to be holy and pure? What does that look like? I think... For many of us, the image of that person is someone who has done away with all material things, someone who, you know, never goes to the, lives a life of poverty, never goes to the movies or eats pizza or watches Netflix. And I suppose there is a place for that in our world. It's just not what most of us experience on a daily basis. So how can those saints even be an example to us of what a life of faith looks like? I think of the people that uh, I put on that list of the names that we read this morning, the people that I knew and loved from that list. And I think about the example of faith that they gave me. And all of those examples are are of a faith not devoid of the struggles of the world. It was never some perfect life of holiness and purity. It's rather those people showed me a life of death and resurrection a life of forgiving and needing forgiveness, a life of believing and hoping in Jesus Christ despite all of the things around that happen around us and to us. Believe it or not, our reading from Ephesians this morning is that kind of faith. Because if you read the whole book of, of Ephesians, it goes from this heavenly ideas to us. It is a faith in grand sweeping ideas of of God's sovereignty, of God's grand design for the world. It is about the hope that we have for our own lives and the world's lives in the future. A hope that is grounded in the faith of God. A faith that we obtain through an inheritance from God that helps us to navigate life. Because those grand ideas must be lived. They must be part of our lives and who we are and what we are about. Jesus Christ, in the Sermon on the Plain, brings those ideas down to us on a plain level. Because there's no way, there's no way that we're going to get it right all the time. There's no way that we will be perfect. There will always be sin with our saintliness. If being a saint is about having an example of what it means to live a life of faith, then what do the people whose names we read this morning tell us about our faith? And I was thinking again about all those people whose names I put on the list, and here's a couple of things about them. First of all, none of them were perfect. Second of all, none of them would have told you that they were perfect. They would have admitted flat out that they had sinned. Third, every one of them believed in God's love, and that love in their life was their hope and their guide. And fourth, they all shared that love with me in some way. On that list, both of my parents are on that list. They're both dead now. It's a fact of my life. It's, for me, it's a hard, hard thing to live without them, quite frankly. I miss them every day. I often think in my head, what would they say or do in any given situation? Now, I, I know they weren't perfect, and I'm going to give you two times when my parents were not perfect, and I saw it. My parents would always fight two times a year, probably more than that, but at least two times a year, 
when they put up the Christmas tree, and when they set up the tent for camping. <laughs> Sometimes so bad that me and my sisters had to run and hide until the carnage was over. And I'm sure if you ask them, they'd like to have some of those moments back. We all have things like that, don't we, in our families, in our friendships, in our relationships. We all have difficult moments. And some of those moments even, you know, they give us a little trauma, right? I don't know any parent or any husband or any spouses who are perfect. But my parents also had great faith. It was lived out every day, and I saw it all the time in them. I know that after those fights, they always forgave each other. They were both very heavily involved in our church. They sang in the choir. They served on committees. But more important than that, they developed caring relationships with people. If you were new to the church I grew up in, I guarantee you one or both of them would come up and start talking to you. Our house was always filled with people. We had parties and get-togethers. We had always had friends and family over. My parents were great at hospitality and creating community. And that's how they lived out their faith. Not everybody has to live it out that way. That's just how they, they lived out their faith. They would also tell me all the time, it's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Even if it didn't look good, even if I wasn't completely convinced it was going to be okay, they somehow kept going, kept working and believing. I've shared a little bit about their sin. Let me tell you a little bit about their sainthood. I'm going to tell you two stories. Both of these stories I heard after they died. The first one was told to me by someone that my dad had worked with at camp. I'll call him George. After my dad's death, George sent a letter telling the story of how he was new at camp. It was his first summer. He didn't really know anybody. And it was staff week. And all the other staff were leaving camp, going off camp to go somewhere. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember where they were going. They were going to go somewhere. And George didn't know anyone. And he didn't have a car. So that meant he was going to have to stay at camp basically by himself and miss out. My dad noticed this and invited him to come with him in his car and go to, the, go to the place where everybody else was going. He told us in a letter how important that moment was to him, how it made him feel part of the staff, part of camp, and he still goes to camp now because of that. That, who, that is who my dad was, always ready to make a new friend and invite new people in. The other was from someone who was from the church I grew up in. We'll call her Becky. After my mom died, Becky told the story of being new to our congregation. And my mom invited her over to our house for fellowship with other people from our church. She showed up, my mom had a fire going, she had snacks and drinks, and Becky sat in our living room feeling the warmth of the community surrounding her. She still goes to that church. She felt like she belonged. And my mother did that for many people. Many people told me stories just like that about it. And I have tried to follow their example, to know the inheritance of God's riches, to know that grace is a free gift, and that everything will be all right with God, to have trust and faith, to forgive people after a big fight, to invite and welcome, to open our home to others. I wonder what the saints on that list have shown all of you. What was it about their faith that was an example to you? How does their example encourage you today? Saints are not super Christians. They're simply sinful people that live by God's grace and offer that to other people. People who offer an invitation to come and share a meal, a ride to make sure someone feels included. So may all of us live in faith just like those saints who from their labors rest. Amen. Let us rise as we sing our hymn of the day, O oh, When the Saints Go Marching In.
Having heard the good news, let us confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United with your saints across time and place, we pray for our shared world. God of time and space, our faith has been passed down through the generations. Bless new believers, catechumens, and any affirming their faith in you, that they share what they have first received. Lord, in your mercy. God of tempest and tide, our world is full of dazzling beauty and brutal destruction. Protect us and all your creatures from hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, and fires. Restore what has been lost. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of truth, raise up leaders with integrity, honesty, and compassion. Unite our elected officials in shared goals that benefit and serve all people. Instill in them hearts of justice, mercy, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, God of tumult, you sustain and guide your people when the way forward is uncertain. Abide with all going through transitions at work, school, or in their personal lives. Bring healing to those who are sick, especially Lori, Helen, Ben, Joanne, Rosa, Pat, Sharon, Ernest, Carolyn, Larry, Roland, the Oliva family, Alva, Gail, Carol, Liesel, Christopher, Barbara, and Betsy. We remember our homebound, Betty Lee and Florence, and we pray for all who serve, especially Joshua, Daniel, Gus, Isaac, and Graham. Reassure us of your constancy in the midst of change. Lord, in your mercy, God of togetherness, deepen the relationships that are built in this place. Form us as a community where tears of sorrow and shouts of joy can both be shared. Lord, in your mercy. God of tenderness, we give thanks for all who have died in the faith. Bill, Kevin, Philip, Catherine, Ken, Tara, Edward, Jack, Elaine, Mike, and Doris. Console our mourning spirits with the promise of eternal life in your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers may be offered aloud and in our hearts. Accept these prayers, gracious God, and those known only to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. You. Let us share God's peace in ways that we feel comfortable and appropriate.
Our worship continues with the offering.
Let us rise. Gifts we bring to place upon your table. We do not worship as we ought, but only as we're able. The vines were planted, seeds were sown. They grew. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the witness of your saints, you show us the hope of our calling and strengthen us to run the race set before us, that we may delight in your mercy and rejoice with them in glory. And so with all your saints, with the choirs of angels and all the host of heaven, we praise your name and join the round ending hymn. Mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It is our teaching and our tradition that we do not celebrate at the Lutheran table, we celebrate at the Lord's table. So everyone who's here and everybody watching online, we invite you to join in this feast of God's mercy and God's grace. You may be seated.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A couple of announcements uh, before we uh, end our worship together this morning. The first is just that there will be no Bible study tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Uh, I will be away Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at the Bishop's Convocation, but there will be outreach committee, because I will still be here, and there will be Bible study on Wednesday night on, on Zoom. Uh, next week is our Stewardship Sunday. We will be writing our commitments for the upcoming year, and we will be having a catered lunch after. Um, if you have not yet, please sign up if you plan on attending that lunch. So we have some numbers to give the caterer, and we know who is coming. Also, November 20th is the Greater Council, Greater Council Interfaith Thanksgiving worship service uh, this year, and uh, it's in the vine. Please, uh, it's a great event. It's a great service. It's a great way to celebrate Thanksgiving, so consider going to that. And November 29th, we will be, again, having beer and hymns at Tandy's at 6.30. Uh, we hope you'll come out and sing some hymns with us and have a libation or water or whatever you want to drink. You don't have to drink beer. Uh, whatever will be fine. So hopefully come, come be with us for that. Once again, I would just like to thank Joan and Heidi and Hillary and Deb from the Granite State Ringers for being with us in worship. What a beautiful uh, thing that was. Let's, yeah, let's <laughs> if you